Section 3. Early History Painting The Academy and the Development of History Paintings Whereas in the 18th century, uh, whereas in 18th century America, the key to artistic success lay in portraiture, expectations for artists in Europe were radically different. During the colonial period, artists in America lacked access to formal art training. As a result, they were either self-taught or apprenticeshipped by other artists. Apprenticed with other artists. Without the possibility of patronage from the church or royal families, artists had to seek out patronage on their own, often traveling around the country and offering to paint family portraits. European countries, on the other hand, had the institutional structures in place to both train artists and exhibit their artworks to the public, thereby cultivating an audience for art and fostering patronage. The first fine art academies were formed in the 16th century Italy to replace the guild system as the principal means of training artists. The French Royal Academy, formed in 1648, went further in codifying the curriculum and function of the academy, which also served as a nationalistic agenda for developing French artists to fulfill royal commissions. Previous monarchs had imported most of their artworks from Italy and Flanders. Instructing, instruction centered on drawing, which was taught by the first, which was taught first by copying etchings and engravings. Students would then move on to copying three-dimensional objects, first plaster casts, then full-size sculptures, and finally drawing from live models. The academy was so inherently hierarchical in nature, one had to apply for membership and advance through it level, its levels over time. Painting was given priority over sculpture. Subject matter was regulated as well. The academies propagated the hierarchy of genres, which established historical paintings as the most elevated subject of art. History paintings were rated highest, followed by portraiture, then genre painting, then landscape, and lastly, still life. Historical paintings were prized by the academy because they were large in scale and featured multiple figures in different poses, and thus demonstrated the complex command of figure drawing. Artists typically took their subjects from the Bible or classic mythology and incorporated an underlying moral message. History painting required both creative and intellect, intellect in that the artist had to use their imagination to develop a scene that they had not witnessed. They often included visual quotations from earlier paintings or classical sculpture, another way for artists to demonstrate their advanced training and art history knowledge. Women were typically precluded from producing history paintings because they were not allowed to study the nude models. Women were rarely allowed to train in the academies. The few that were admitted often had a familial connection to an existing member. Female acad uh, academians were guided towards floral painting and portraiture. The European art world was dominated by academies developed in, on the French model, including the Royal Academy in London. Founded by Sir Joshua Reynolds in 1769, Royal, the Royal Academy sought to establish artistic standards to promote and the cause of British art. The American-born artist Benjamin West, who was a founding member of the Academy, became its second president after the death of Joshua Reynolds in 1792. West played a pivotal role in introducing the ideas of history paintings based on contemporary events with his 1770 painting, The Death of General Wolfe. Okay, so really quickly, um, The Death of General Wolfe, this painting also gets brought up a lot. So General Wolfe is going to be a famous um, artist in the French and Indian War or the Seven Years' War, depending on what continent you're on. But he died in America, and so this famous uh, painting by Benjamin West uh, depicts that. And this is kind of the painting that rose him to the fame um, and the, the position of power that he is uh, known for being in. You know, training John Singleton Copley, among other artists. Um, I believe he also painted uh, Stuart as well, yeah. So... 
the reason for that is this famous painting right here. And so, again, you see multiple poses. Uh, and, of course, um, Benjamin West wasn't there himself, so all of this is imagined. Um, you see the battlefield raging on in the background. Um, anyways, so I thought I, I would just highlight this because um, this is a very important painting, and it does get brought up a lot in uh, Act Deck. Because uh, a lot of artists have connections to Benjamin West. So even in the future, this painting will probably get brought up. I don't know about next year, though, just because of the subject matter. But still, they're probably connected somehow. Um, so yeah, I thought that was an important thing to just note there. Keep this painting in mind. Benjamin West painted this. It's about a British general dying in the French and Indian War. Or the Seven Years' War, whichever. It was the French and Indian War in America. Okay, the French Royal Academy was dissolved in the aftermath of the French Revolution, but the academic model continued, and as royal patronage um, receded importance, receded in importance, art academies focus on professor professionalization of artists and developing patrons. While art training was their primary function, the Academy's annual art exhibits and lectures played a crucial role in providing exposure for artists and educating the public about art. Meanwhile, in the United States, artists recognized the need to establish their own academies to develop artistic talent domestically. Having lost talented painters like West and Copley to England, academies realized that keeping artists in America required developing an institutional support system. The French Royal... Oh. Fuck. <laughs> the American Academy of the Fine Arts, originally known as the New York Academy of Fine Arts, was founded in 1802. With this in mind, John Trumbull, whose history paintings of the Revolutionary War came to define the conflict for generations, was the president of the organization for 20 years. Under his leadership, history paintings and the study of classical models were promoted. However, Trumbull and the American Academy's conservatism led to a dissatisfaction among young painters. In 1825, Samuel Morse, Asher Durand, Thomas Cole, and others founded the National Academy of Design in New York City to promote fine arts in America through instruction and exhibition. Selected works, such as Segesser II, made around 1720. History of the Segesser Hides. The Segesser Hides, painted by indigenous Americans under Spanish influence, are among the earliest historical narratives painted in America. The Hides were acquired by Philip von Segesser von Brutenegg, a Jesuit priest who oversaw San Xavier de Bach in uh, Pimeria Alta, a mission in what is now Arizona, from 1732 until 1735. Segesser was then transferred farther south in what is known as New Spain to a mission in Pimeria Baja. There he acquired three large painted hides, probably from the Anzas, who were prominent military who were a prominent military family Segesser sent the two hides sent the hides to his brother in Switzerland in 1758 two survived and remained in Switzerland with the Segesser family for more than 200 years in 1983 they were acquired by the New Mexico History Museum allowing the hides to return to the location where they were likely created Subject Matter and Visual Analysis Today, the hides are known as Segesser 1 and Segesser 2. A portion of the Segesser 2 hide is shown in your Art Reproductions tablet. Each is, made, or booklet. Each is made of three rectangular sections in what is likely bison hide, sewn together with sinew and painted with naturally occurring pigments. Both hides depict armed conflicts between native peoples of Europe. Segesser 1 might show a skirmish at the vicinity of El Paso uh, and Ciudad Juarez, but the exact date and location are unknown. 
It is believed that the artworks were commissioned by Spaniards from a Pueblo workshop. The, uh, the large scale of Segesser II, which measure, measures 17 feet in length, creates a panoramic image that fills an entire wall, much like the woven tapestries depicting battles that were used to decorate palaces in Europe. Segesser II depicts a known historical event where a battle, uh, a, a battle wherein Spanish troops and their allies were defeated in what is now Nebraska by the Skitty Pawnees and Odies. In 1720, Governor Antonio Valadere, oh my gosh, Valverde and Cosio of the province of New Mexico, which was part of New Spain, sent Spanish forces into the Great Plains because the governor, governor was concerned that French traders were infil, infiltrating the area and establishing settlements in Spanish territory. He hoped to establish a new outpost for the Spanish Empire in the plains. Pedro de Villasur sent out from Santa Fe with 40 Spanish troops, 60 Pueblo soldiers, and a dozen Apache guides and a Spanish priest. They traveled northeast, eventually moving through Kansas and into eastern Nebraska. The group set up camp near the confluence of the Lout and Plat, uh, Plate Rivers. They were, uh, they were, there they were attacked in their sleep by the Pawnee and Odie warriors who lived in the area and who were allies of the French. Ten Pueblo soldiers and three dozen Spaniards, including Villasur himself, were among the dead. Survivors lost all their trade goods and supplies and were forced to return to New Mexico in defeat. Segesser II depicts a group of Spaniards who can be identified by their brown, white-brimmed hats, wide-brimmed hats, grouped together and encircled by the enemy. The Pueblo men and the Spaniards both wore sleeveless jackets made of seven layers, several layers. This was intended to protect the wearers from arrows. The Pueblos were, hat were hatless, with long hair tied in buns. Frenchmen are depicted in tricorn hats, with blue or reddish-brown coats and shit leggings. The Pawnee and Odie warriors are nude or in leggings and moccasins. They are also decorated with vivid, in individualized body paint. One figure is painted half blue and half white, while another is red and white. Uh, another has red and white horizontal stripes, and there are several men painted with white and red dots. They are armed with bows and arrows, spears and swords and hatchets. The Europeans also have rifles. A hooded man holding a cross can be identified as the priest accompanying the expedition, Father Juan Minguez. Franciscan ministry, uh, minis, missionary uh, is shown blessing the injured and dying men. He eventually died in the attack as well. Scholars have found no evidence indicating French soldiers participated in the battle, but rumors circulated that they were there. One theory uh, posits that French soldiers are included here to help Governor Valader, uh, Valverde explain the defeat of his troops to the Viceroy of New Spain. It, it suggests the importance of visual arts in helping establish historical narrative. The amount of detail in the painting implies that it was based upon a first-hand account of the battle, perhaps recounted directly by the painter uh, to the painter by one of the early 50 Pueblo fighters who returned. The painting effectively captures the chaos and confusion of battle and precariously alliances formed between various native and the precarious alliances formed between the native, uh, various native and European factions. Contextual analysis. In 18th century Santa Fe, arch, uh, archival evidence documents how the Spanish employed Pueblo people to manufacture goods for exports to southern markets in New Spain. These goods included clothing, wagons, and decorated hides known as reposteros that were painted by Pueblo artists in workshops. It is assumed that one or more indigenous persons, likely, Pueb likely Pueblo, but possibly, um, 
Tacolin or Taraskin painted both the Segesser hides. Indigenous artists likely drew upon European drawing conventions introduced to them by the Spaniards. In central Mexico, it was common in this era for European-trained Spanish artists to oversee workshops of native artists. The person or people who painted the hides used European art techniques like foreshortening, overlapping figures in space, and naturalistic depictions of the human form in profile. There is a limited use of spatial perspective. The Segesser II figures show more sophistication in terms of bodily portions, three-dimensionality, and suggestions of movement. If both hides were painted by one artist, it is likely that Segesser I was painted first, followed by Segesser II, since the latter implies the hand of a more experienced artist. The fact that they are similar in size, with similar decorative borders that frame each scene, indicates that they were intended to be displayed together, possibly with the third, now destroyed, painting. Um, and f the reason for this clarification um, of the Segesser 1 being painted before Segesser 2, you might think, well, obviously it's called Segesser 1 and then Segesser 2. The reason is because they don't actually know in what order... It, it, like the reason for their names uh it might be because of when they were made but the resource is just clarifying here that uh segesser one is the first because we don't actually know when they were painted like exactly so we don't actually know who was which was painted first so the resource is clarifying segesser one is probably the one that was painted first and that's why it's segesser one i think Selected work: Benjamin West's Pen Treaty with the Pen's Treaty with the Indians, 1771 to 72. Benjamin West biography: Benjamin West was born in Pennsylvania in 1738 in a Quaker community outside of Philadelphia. West's grandparents were among the original Quaker settlers of Pennsylvania. He was the tenth child of a couple that owned an inn. West claimed that he learned color mixing from Native Americans in the area who taught him how they would mix red and yellow to create a yellow earth to create pigments. He learned to draw by copying engravings and portraits that hung in the homes of his friends and family. He entered Benjamin Franklin's College of Philadelphia when he was 17. At 21, with the financial backing of two wealthy Philadelphia families, he left the colonies to study art in Europe. West spent several years traveling in Italy before he settled in London in 1763. He quickly established himself as a promising painter, earning the respect of the British painting establishment. He was involved in the founding of the Royal Academy, went on to succeed Joshua Reynolds as president of the Academy, and was painter to George the, King George III throughout the American Revolution. Though West never returned to the United States, his impact on American art was tremendous since so many Americans sought at him out and studied with him in London. Among the artists who sent time in West's studio were John Singleton Copley, Gilbert Stuart, John Trumbull, Thomas Sully, and Samuel F. B. Morse. West's best-known painting was The Death of General Wolfe commemorating the British general's death during the French and Indian War. This work was exhibited at the Royal Academy to great success in 1771. Uh, the painting represents an event called the Battle of the Plains of Abraham, also known as the Battle of Quebec, in which both the French and British generals, Montcalm and Wolfe, were killed. The battle allows the British to lay the battle allowed the British to lay siege to Quebec City, an important step in their eventual victory over France. The painting was purchased by Lord Grove, Grosvenor, and the king ordered a second copy made. The image was subsequently made into an engraving, which allowed it to be seen by a much wider audience. It even appeared on British ceramic mugs that were marketed at home and abroad. Part of this painting's popularity was due to West's radical approaches to the conventions of the genre. A history painting was considered the pinnacle of artistic ability because it contained elements of other types of paintings. 
In order to be a successful history painter, an artist had to be able to paint landscape, portraiture, and genre scenes. History paintings are distinguished by their grand scale, dynamic, multi-figured compositions, and subject matter drawn from the Bible or from classical or modern history. Tradition had dictated that heroic sub subjects should be dressed in the timeless clothing, clothing of ancient Greece. West refused and insisted that his subjects wear modern dress. And in doing so, he revolutionized history paintings by combining modernity with tradition. General Wolfe was wounded three times in batter, battle, with the third injury proving fatal. Yet his actual death certainly did not take place in such an artifully artfully composed dramatic scene. Instead, the artist chose to bring pathos to Wolf's death by appropriating the body position of lamentation. The lamentation of Christ was a common subject in Renaissance and Baroque art. The term refers to the scene of Jesus after his body has been removed from the cross and his family and friends mourn over his body. The general's death in his attempt to to expand the British Empire is equated to Christ's sacrifice and suffering for mankind. West transforms Wolf into a martyr for the British cause. On the left side of the painting, there is a messenger arriving with news of the British victory in battle, uh, which the general leans, uh, learns of at the moment of his death. A tattooed Iroki man is seated on the left in a thoughtful position. He is only partially clothed, which connects him to the classical uh, sculpture and allows West to show his knowledge of classical references. It, is, it also allows the artist to demonstrate his ability to paint the human form. All the other people in the scene are reacting to the general's uh, are reacting to the general's death. They are either surrounding Wolf and attempting to help him or already mourning his passage. The Iroki man is calmly observing the situation. His presence also situates the painting in North American colonies during the Battle of Quebec. At the time when tensions between colonies and the British were brewing, the painting served to remind viewers of the struggles of the period where the British and the colonists, as well as their Indian allies, were united in their struggles against the French. West was adept at using the past to comment on the present. Following the success of his work, West painted another American a North American subject featuring Native Americans, later that same year titled Penn's Treaty with the Indians. Subject Matter and Visual Analysis Penn's Treaty with the Indians was intended to com uh, commemorate Penn's arrival in the area that would become Pennsylvania in 1682. The moment recorded the first legal agreement between Europeans and Native Americans. While the agreement existed, the meeting as depicted by West probably never occurred. William Penn was a Quaker, and Quakers were also known as the Religious Society of Friends, which had been founded in England in the late 1640s. Penn sought the freedom to practice Quakerism, a religion that was non-hierarchical and non-violent in the New World. One of the religion's tenets was egalitarianism. Quakers believed that all members were equal and disavowed the power structures of both Catholicism and Protestantism. In England, this attracted the negative attention of both Puritans and Angelicals, and the Quakers arrived in, New America, in North America in search of religious freedom. West's painting, Penn's Treaty with the Indians, shows William Penn meeting the chiefs of the Lenni Lape, or Delaware, tribes under an ancient elm tree. The site is known as... Shakamoxon. The site is known as Shakamaxon, and the agreement is often known as the Treaty of Shakamaxon. Penn's treaty with the Delaware tribes was significant, and it was the first legal agreement between Europeans and indigenous peoples, as well as the first time the British colonists paid the Native Americans for land that had already been granted to them by the British government. It is unknown if this meeting actually took place. But the painting promoted the idea that Penn maintained peaceful relations with the local indigenous people. While there wasn't any physical violence between Penn and the Lenape or the Del and Delaware people, their displacement from their lands, agreements or not, was its own form of violence. 
by 1737, any disputed harmony between the tribes and settlers had eroded as Penn's son, Thomas, began stealing their land to satisfy the demands of an increasing number of new settlers. It is likely that Thomas, Penn's commission, Thomas Penn commissioned this painting in part to reassert his family's claim to power in the region. Unlike The Death of General Wolfe, which features a diagonal, uh, a diagonal upon which the composition is organized, the focus of this painting is horizontal and balanced. To emphasize equal exchange, oh, to emphasize equal exchange, Penn holds the treaty, but the emphasis of the painting is on, is on the bolt of cloth being offered. The equanimity of fa and fairness of the exchange was a point of pride for William Penn and became the central theme of the painting. However, the artist embeds the composition with racist tropes. The composition is divided in half, with the Native Americans on the darker, more wooded side, and Penn and his fellow Quakers on the other side, which is lighter and more orderly, with buildings being raised in the background. The artist chose to associate the Native Americans with darkness, nature, and primitivism, while presenting the newly arrived Europeans in a light, surrounded by buildings under construction and ships arriving in the distance, as though they were bringing civilization and enlightenment to the indigenous people. Such narratives were used by settler colonists to justify their treatment of the Native Americans they sought to displace. Structurally, the painting can also be divided into thirds. The observers are in the foreground, the main action takes place in the middle ground, and the background establishes the settings. There are also three vertical sections. The central position, where, which features a meeting between settlers and Native Americans. The left side, which shows seated colonists. And the right side, which shows an indigenous family. The background is further separated into three parts. There is a harbor on the left behind the workers. Houses in the center behind the meeting. And the wilderness on the right behind the indigenous observers. The three sections call to mind tr tracheops, tracheops found in Renaissance, uh, Renaissance altarpieces, where the central center panel is reinforced by its two side panels. The division also emphasizes the three factions, Merchant, Quaker, and Native Americans, whose compelling interests shaped Pennsylvania for most of the 18th century. Benjamin West's representation of Native Americans. Benjamin West was aware that audiences in England were especially curious about N North America and Native Americans in particular. He embraced the novelty afforded him by his birth in the colonies. As noted earlier, West even claimed that American Indians had taught him how to mix pigments when he had grown up in Pennsylvania. The inclusion of Native Americans into his artwork allowed West to remind the viewers of his connection to America. West included indigenous people in both of his well-known artworks, The Death of General Wolfe and Penn's Treaties with the Indian. West portrayed the Native Americans uh, uh, embodies the noble savage trope, which was the generalization popularized in the 18th century by Swiss-born philosopher and writer Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean Jacques Rousseau, that upheld indigenous people as being in harmony with the natural world and untouched by Western civilization. The stereotype had an effect of rendering Native Americans as foreign and other in paintings and literature, despite them being the original inhabitants of the land that is being represented. Selected Work The Boston Massacre um, painted by Henry Pelham, and printed and sold by Paul Revere. Engraved, printed, and sold by Paul Revere in 1770. Prince and the American Revolution. Benjamin West had a pivotal influence on the entire generation of artists that followed him, including artists like John Singleton Copley. And yet, in the leads up to the American Revolution, it was not a large-scale it was not large-scale history paintings that inflamed the masses and sparked insurrection. Instead, it was the cheap prints in mass circulation that helped shape public opinion about the revolutionary cause. 
During the 18th century, as talk of rebellion and revolution began to roil the colonists, prints and cartoons and broadsides were the most popular method for quickly circulating ideas in urban areas. Engravings were produced by using a tool called a uh, burin to cut into the surface of a metal plate. Once the plate was produced, the printer could produce many copies from a single plate, allowing them to be sold to a number a large number of people. Artists often use humor to make their point and combined words and images. The prints helped make the general populace more aware of political debates and controversies. In colonial America, prints were sold on the street or from bookstores or print shops. They could also be purchased through subscriptions. Um, and then again, note that this painting right here, this is going to be John Singleton Copley's uh, brother, Henry Pelham, and it's a boy with a flying squirrel. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Subject matter and visual analysis. Although long associated with Paul Revere, the printer who, origin who was the original source of the Boston Massacre print, The printer who is the original source of the Boston Massacre print was actually, actually, Henry Pelham. Pelham depicts the Boston Massacre when British troops, who had been a heavy presence in Boston since pro uh, protests over the Stamp Act began, fired on an unruly group of citizens. 4,000 British soldiers were stationed in the city at the time of Boston had only 1,500 inhabitants. On the evening of March 5, 1770, a crowd of laborers, apprentices, and merchant sailors began throwing snowballs and rocks at the soldiers. A shot was heard, which caused several soldiers to begin firing upon the crowd. Five men were killed, including Crispus Attucks, a dock worker and native African, uh, a dock worker of African and Native American descent. Historians believe that. Um, Atticus was either a free man or an escaped slave from Framingham, Massachusetts. Atticus is considered to be the first casualty of the American Revolution. At the same time, some Bostonians were sympathetic to the soldiers and predisposed against the unruly mob of laborers, many of whom were Irish, Catholic, or black. This print was issued three weeks after the incident and helped Forment anger towards the British with its depiction of a line of stone-faced soldiers firing upon unarmed citizens. The British redcoats stand in front of a custom, in front of the customs house. Above them is a sign reading "Butcher's Hall," though no such sign existed at the scene. The implication is that the redcoats were butchers in their treatment of the colonists. The British soldiers all stand in a unified diagonal row with their left leg extended forward and their muskets aggressively pointed at the unarmed crowd. The soldiers' faces are angular with severe expressions. The Americans have softer, more individualized facial expressions. Three bleeding bodies are sprawled about on the ground. Two other figures are bleeding and being carried by bystanders. A woman in blue clasps a woman in blue clasps her hands and looks concerned. The only other woman in the crowd of men is the only other woman in the crowd of men in tricorn hats. She calls to mind the mourning figure of the Virgin Mary in the Renaissance crucifixion scenes. The crowd appears to, as innocent victims, though they had in fact initiated the confrontation. Smoke fills the square behind them, and even and though the event took place at night, here we see a blue sky. Several prominent Boston landmarks can be seen in the background, the prominence of which was the old state's house, known as the townhouse during this time. The steeple of the first church can also be seen. The print helped to sway public opinion in favor of the crowd who are depicted as unassuming victims of the soldiers' aggressive tactics. The Controversy Over Attribution In 1770, Paul Revere published a print that he copied from a design of Henry Pil Pelham, John Singleton Copley's stepbrother, 
and the subject of his 1765 painting, Boy with a Squirrel. Copley had also painted Revere's portrait in 1768 and had purchased jewelry and miniature frames from Revere on several occasions. Pelham was 22 when the massacre took place, just blocks from his home on a new, on what is now Congress Street. Pelham likely lent Revere his engraving for it, for his use as a reference, not expecting Revere to copy it directly. Revere started selling his version of the print on March 26, 1770. He, but he did not expect, he did not credit Pelham or compensate him for his contribution. Revere made a few additions, adding the words Butcher's Hall to the Customs House and, and House and captioning the print with 18 lines of verse, which began, Unhappy Boston, see thy sons deplore, thy Howard walks besmeared with guilty core. Also listed are the unhappy sufferers, Samuel Gray, Samuel Maverick, James Caldwell, Crispus Attucks, and Patrick Carr. And it is noted that there were six wounded, two of them, Christer Monk and John Clary, uh, mortally injured. Pelham tried to sell his version of the print a week after, but Revere's version had already dominated the market. Pelham responded by writing Revere an angry, angry letter accusing him of the most dishonorable action you could well be guilty of, and claiming that it was as if you have plundered me on the highway. Unfortunately, Pelham had no legal recourse. When England did establish copyright laws to protect public publishers as early as 1735, the law wasn't strongly enforced in the 18th century, especially in the faraway American colonies. Emmanuel Lutz, Washington Crossing the Delaware, 1851. Emmanuel Lutz, Biography. The artist who painted one of the best-known paintings in American history was born in Germany, near Wittenberg, in 1618. Lutz's parents were political refugees who fled their home country and immigrated to the United States in 1825, when Emanuel was nine. He later studied art with John Reuben Smith, and, like many American artists, he initially found work as an internet portraitist. Lutz spent time in Washington, D.C. before moving to Dusseldorf, Germany in 1840 for formal art training. There, he studied historical paintings with uh, Wilhelm Sch uh, Shadow and Carl Lessings at Dusseldorf's Royal Art Academy. Throughout the colonial period and early republic, it was common for American artists like Benjamin West and John Singleton Copley to seek training and international recognition by studying art in London. By the early 1840s, Rome and Florence had replaced London as the major draw for American artists, but in the 1850s, artists from America began to travel to Germany. The Dusseldorf Academy, which was then led by William Morris Hunt, began to attract painters from all over the world. Among the American painters who passed through the German Academy were Caleb Bingham, Eastman Johnson, Worthington Whitredge, Richard Canson Woodville, and William S. Uh, Hasseltine. An artistic approach can be that came from to be known as the Dusseldorf style was characterized by attention to drafting, dynamic compositions, and lighting, and dramatic lighting. The heavy flow of Germans into America may have played a part in promoting a greater interest in and appreciation of German culture in America during this time. In the seventeen, uh, the eighteen forties and fifties. Uh, Lutz became one of the leading artists of the Dusseldorf Academy. Artists who trained at the Dusseldorf Academy became known for their distinctive style and characterized by dynamic compositions and dy dramatic lighting. Lutz believed passionately in America's democratic government and supported the German uprising of 1848 against the king. After, the U uh, after more than a decade in Germany, Lutz returned to the U.S. in 1851 while he was in the United States, Lutz painted his most famous work, Washington Crossing the Delaware. Lutz would spend the rest of his life moving between Dusseldorf, New York, and Washington. In 1862, he completed his mural, Westward, uh, The Course of Empire Takes Its Way, for the west stairwell of the house wing of the Capitol. 
Lutz died on January 18, 1868 in Washington, D.C. All right, really quickly, um, I just wanted to call into attention. This is uh, Westward, The Course of Empires. So this is a Manifest Destiny painting. It's to show civilization heading towards the west coast of the United States. So I just really wanted to draw attention. This is that work that is, was being referenced. And we see um, down here, you have a, just a long landscape portrait and then a, a very complex, large portrait similar to Washington Crossing the Delaware. So I just wanted to draw that into mind. And I believe that that is George Washington with a bird or an eagle in his hand holding the American flag. So that's what that is, I think. So anyways, subject matter and visual analysis. Painted to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Washington's death, Washington crossing the Delaware is momental and lionizing image. It is over 12 feet wide and 21 feet long, filling an entire wall. The painting famously commemorates an episode in the Revolutionary War when General when George Washington and his army crossed the Delaware River on Christmas night in 1776. It was a cold winter, and the crossing was difficult, as can be seen from the boatmen struggling to navigate the icy waters. Nevertheless, Washington prevailed and was able to lead his troops to victory against the battalion of Hessian soldiers stationed near Trenton, New Jersey. It was a critical victory coming at the moment when the colonial army was struggling, and it helped to restore faith in the colonial cause. Very quickly, Hessian soldiers are German soldiers for hire. So, um, if you see reference to Hessians, that's what it is. In Lutz's painting, the soldiers looked cold and weary. Those holding oars strain and look awkward as they navigate icy strewn river. In contrast, Washington is solid and upright. Standing in the small boat, he is clearly the focal point. We see him in profile, with his cloak billowing behind him, behind, much the way the flag on the boat blows backwards. Creating a visual equivalency between Washington and the flag. Historians have noted that the painting is rife with historical inaccuracies. The event took place at night. The river was not nearly as wide as it appears in the painting. Accuracy was not Luce's primary intention. Designed to instill patriotism, the work was painted in the 1850s, at a time when the country was becoming increasingly divided over the issue of slavery. An American Icon and Its Influence Jacob Lawrence, one of the most prominent African-American artists of the early 20th century, painted his own version of the subject in its 1954. Unlike Lutz with his massive oil painting, Lawrence painted with egg temp uh, tempera, tempera on a piece of hardboard measuring just under 12 by 16 inches. It is one of a series of 30 pictures dealing with aspects of the United States history that are collectively titled Struggle from the History of the American People. This painting was intended to be the 10th work in the series. It shows three rowboats containing members of Washington's army huddled over blankets. The diagonal lines of the boat oars digging downward into the water are counterbalanced by the lines of the soldier's bayonets, which point towards the sky. The boat is the center foreground above to have blood dripping off the side, and blood can also be seen on the boat in the back right side. Rather than focusing on Washington, Lawrence gives in, uh, attention to the anonymous, huddled soldiers wrapped in blankets and rowing determinately and in unison. The emphasis is on the collective rather than an individual effort. The red paint dripping down the sides of the boats like blood suggests American freedom was not achieved without bloody violence. All right, again, I just wanted to draw attention to the work being referenced here. So this is, um, it's the three boats uh, crossing the Delaware. This is Washington, but as you can see, he's kind of, um, he kind of blends in with the rest of the collective group. That's the emphasis of the spears going down with their, um, um, bayonets sticking up so that's what that's talking about uh this is the jacob lawrence part there 20 years later another african-american artist would revisit the same subject in 1975 robert 
Colescott painted George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware, page from an American history textbook, in which he replaced the military leader with Carver, the famed African-American scientist and inventor. Colescott fills the boat with uh, caricatured depictions of black stereotypes, as if to comment on the inadequate way African-Americans have been represented in traditional histories of America. While Colescott employed more biting satire than Lawrence, both painters deployed Lutz's Im immediately recognizable image to focus attention on the narratives that had been surpassed by the dominant culture. All right, so really quickly, this is uh, George Washington Carver crossing the Delaware, and here are all of those different stereotypes. Uh, a drunk guy, a dude good at music, like a poor, um, what are those called? Drifters, I think. Um... And so that's what that's supposed to be. You got the 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 uh, train worker. Um, I'm not sure what that's supposed to be. Just a general like a maid or caregiver, I guess. A thief, a chef, and then like a fisherman. Um, and then again, you have George Washington Carver here, and I'm not sure what that's supposed to be either. Um, so that's the the use of the employment of like caricatures in that uh, Robert Colescott. Cole Scott painting there. All right. In 2010, a Japanese American artist reentered uh, reinterpreted the scene through the lens of the Asian American experience. Roger Shimura Shimomura used the iconic work as inspiration for a self-portrait which he called Shimomura Crossing the Delaware. The large-scale acrylic painting, standing over 6 feet tall and 12 feet wide, consists of three carved panels. Shinomura paints himself as George Washington in uniform, and the colonial soldiers are replaced with samurai warriors. The stylized water and flattening pictorial composition recall the Edo Prince period Prince of Hokusia. Here the boat is situated within San, the San Francisco Harbor rather than the Delaware River. Angel Island, the immigration station where thousands of immigrants arrived arriving from Asia were processed, can be seen in the background. By transposing the location, Shinomura makes the point of that the Asian immigrant experience in America is just as challenging as the difficulties faced by colonists who fought the British. Shinomura understands this all too well, as he himself was detained along with his family at an internment camp for Japanese Americans in Idaho during World War II. All right, so this is uh, Shinomura crossing the Delaware. This is his self-portrait. And then these are like the highly stylized waters that they were talking about. Um, these are probably the Rockies. That's going to be Angel Island right there, I believe. And then um, we see, I think that's a modernized American flag. It looks like it has more than 13 <laughs> stars, but it could be the traditional um, and yeah, you, so you have the heavily stylized sort of, uh, traditional Japanese artwork that you might think of. All right. Selected work, Harriet Powers, Pictorial Quilt, 1695 to 98. The History of American Quilting Traditions. Most of the history paintings we have studied thus far were produced by men. Women were largely excluded from formal artistic training and were forced to find other ways to express complex narratives, including sewing and needlepoint. As 18th and 19th century samplers indicate, many American women developed advanced sewing skills by the time that they were teenagers, having learned basic hand sewing techniques by the age of four or five. Quilts were treasured family objects, and some were even signed with the quilter incorporating her name into the design. Records show that quilts were often mentioned in wills and passed down from one to generation to the next, further suggesting that they were valued as artwork and not as mere household goods. 19th century quilts typically contain a quilt top featuring piecework or applique, an interlayer and a back backing. Piecework, or patchwork, refers to a smaller piece of cloth that is sewn together, often in an arrangement of geometric patterns. Applique is when pieces of fabric are stitched into larger pieces to create a picture or pattern. The rise of quilting in America can be tied to the growing industrialization. 
In the 18th century, cloth was either hand-spun or imported from Europe or Asia at great cost. But by the early 19th century, roller-printed cloth was being manufactured in New England and the Mid-Atlantic. This was an industry built upon the work of enslaved laborers who had harvested cotton in the South. By 1835, the cotton mills in Massachusetts were producing 750,000 yards of cotton fabric per week. These numbers would rise even more dramatically after the Civil War. This cotton, printed with small repeating patterns, became known as calico and became widely used in quilt making. Quilts were a popular form of art due to their mobility and practicality. As the U.S. population moved westward, quilts could be easily packed and transported across the country. For women who were marrying and leaving their families behind, quilts could provide a welcome connection to their past. Not all quilts were intended as bed covers. Some were designed to commemorate special events and were presented by their owners. A quilt by a single maker, made in honor of a special event like a wedding, is known as a presentation quilt. Quilts made by a group of women, where each contributes a square, are called album quilts. For 19th century America, women were limited uh, access to fine art training. At Plique quilts could function as a blank canvas upon which they could stitch everything from still life botanical compositions to scenes from everyday life. To scenes of everyday life, historic moments, and family portraits. All the major genres of paintings can be found in quilted form. For example, Hannah Stocking Styles Trade and Commerce Quilt, made around 1835, combines several genres of visual arts in an applique design. It features a tree of life at its center, a popular quilting motif from the planned, uh, patterns found on palampores, a form of bed covering produced in India and imported to the colonies in the 18th century. Surrounding the tree is a border displaying a river with 11 boats, including large streamers, sloops, and little dories. The artist lived near the water in Philadelphia, and her quilt shows the bustling Delaware Riverfront as an active international trade that took place there. The border further shows the v vignettes of everyday life with great detail even providing a window into the fashionable attire of the 1830s. Stills succeeded in providing a complex picture of life in one of the nation's biggest cities during the 18 early republic, while also combining elements of still life, landscape, and garden scenes into the quilt. So I haven't seen this come up, but I wanted to touch on it really quickly. This is the, um, Finnemore, or the, um, I'm sorry, the the quilt that was just touched on um so it's got the tree of life in the middle and then it's got different types of boats going around the border again i haven't seen this quilt come up but um there it is so and again that artist is going to be hannah stocking styles in, ni in the 1980s, artist Faith Ringgold created a genre she called story quilts, which brought together her insecting interests in civil rights, feminism, and black folk tale tradition. Ringgold is adamant about her expanding and complicating notions of fine art, and as a part of the effort, she refers to her quilts as paintings made in the medium of quilting. African-American quilt traditions received renewed attention in 2002 when a distinctive, bright, abstract quilt made by women in the G. Bend community of Alabama were exhibited in the Museum of Fine Art in Houston, Texas. The exhibition received tremendous critical acclaim and toured the country, traveling to New York, Boston, Washington, Atlanta, Cleveland, and San Francisco. A New York Times art critic described G. Bend quilts as some of the most miraculous works of modern art America has produced. Imagine Matsy and Klee. If you think I'm wildly exaggerating, see the show. Arising from, not from the rare field Europe, but from the caramel soil of the rural South. In response to the huge success of the exhibition, the local quilters formed the G. Bend Quilting Collective to market their quilts and offer quilting retreats 
Their efforts at outreach and education enabled them to teach their techniques to future generations. Harriet Powers, Biography Born in Georgia in 1837, Harriet later married Armstead Powers, and the couple had at least nine children. They became landowners soon, sometime after they were emancipated. Her gravestone, which is found in Athens Gospel Pilgrim Cemetery, gives her death date as the 1st of January 1910. Harriet Powers created two story quilts, the pictorial quilt, which is now in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, um, and the Bible quilt, which is in the Smithsonian Institution. They are among the best-known examples of 19th century quilts. Powers was a, devoted, a devout Christian who infused her work with biblical references and cosmological symbols. Her quilts, which have uh, both hand and sewing machine, machine stitching, received public notice when they were exhibited at international fairs. fairs. The Smithsonian's Bible quilt was displayed at the 1886 Cotton Fair in Athens, Georgia, where it attracted the attention of a local artist named Jeannie Smith. Smith described the quilt, writing that, I have spent my whole life in the South, and I am perfectly familiar with 30 patterns of quilt, but I have never seen an original design and never a living creature portrayed in patchwork until the year 1886, when there was held in Athens, Georgia, a cotton fair, which was on a much larger scale than an ordinary county fair. As there was a Wild West show, and cotton weddings, and a circus all the same. The scenes on the pictor the quilt were biblical, and I was fascinated. I offered to buy it, but it was not for sale at any price. Several years later, Power needed the income and went back to Smith, offering a quilt the quilt for $10.00. Smith responded that she only had five to give, and Powers were reluctantly agreed to the sale. Before turning the quilt over, she explained the meaning behind each of the quilt's 11 patterns. Evidence suggests that Smith arranged for the Bible quilt to be shown at the 1895 Cotton State and International Exposition in Atlanta. Subject Matter and Visual Analysis The pictorial quilt is the second known quilt by Harriet Powers. It was given to Dr. Charles Hubert Hall, president of the Union Theological Seminary in New York, by the faculty ladies of the U Atlanta University upon his retirement as chairman of the university's board of trustees. And as the pictorial quilt, Powers was careful to describe each individual block. Powers fused applic techniques and storytelling in ways that recall the textiles of Dahomey in Western Africa. The Fawn Kingdom of Dahomey in present-day Berlin was known for a, uh, a pleaked textile wall hangings that featured mythological subjects and historical events. The 15 panels in this quilt were sewn on a machine with typical fabrics from the period. Powers combined biblical stories with local history and unusual weather phenomena. Powers supplied keys to her quilts, which allowed us to know exactly what each panel was intended to represent. Among the characteristics and scenes referenced are Adam and Eve, Jonah and the whale, Job, Moses, John baptizing Christ, and the crucifixion. Other events depicted include the meteor storm of 1833 and 1846 and Black Friday of 1780 when smoke produced by a forest fire caused the skies to darken. One panel tells the story of a hog that ran 500 miles from Georgia to Virginia. The center panel represents the Leonoid meteor storm that occurred on November 13, 1833. Powers includes eight shooting stars uh, appliqued to the blue background. Figures with upraised arms indicate the panic caused by the event. There is a large white hand in the upper left hand um, in the upper left to represent the hand of God. As Powers herself described it, the people were frightened and thought that the end of times had come. God hand stayed the stars. God's hand stayed the stars. Powers called her quilts sermons in patchwork, and they were both a form of religious expression and a means of creative communication. 
All right, so really quickly, um, so this is the uh, pictorial quilt here. Uh, this right here, if you see my mouse, that's going to be the hand of God in that meteor shower. Um, this, I believe, is meant to be Black Friday. As you can see, the sun, but the sky is completely black. This is going to be, I believe, an, um, Moses. No, 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 no. This is going to be Moses. Um, that might be uh job this is the crucifixion of course um that's probably adam and eve because of the angel right here and there's just two of them uh however i could also see an um this being Adam and Eve right here. Oh no no no, that's that's Black Friday. Never mind. So yeah, I'm pretty sure this is supposed to this is this is Adam and Eve because here's the serpent. Never mind. Um John baptizing Christ is right here, I believe. Um So, but it's a very complex quilt. So, yeah. Anyways, thanks for thanks for watching.